Hello and uh, welcome to today's uh, ISLC Art Committee seminar. So we have a very exciting topic today. We're going to talk about state of the art in combination immunotherapy and radiotherapy for non-small cell lung cancer. So my name is Corinne Feverfin. I'm the uh, chair of the Advanced Radiotherapy Technology Committee of the uh, ISLC and I work in uh, uh, the Christine Manchester in the UK. I'm also the moderator for today's programme. So I'm going to start with running through some uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, so if you would like to download today's slides, uh, you can access them by clicking on the link on the uh, uh, webinar page in this chat. You will also be able to find a video recording of this uh, seminar uh, and you will get the link within the next uh, few days. Uh, it's also great news that we have an article on this topic that has been uh, published in uh, the Journal of Thoracic Oncology, and that is available to the attendees of this uh, webinar. So again, to access this journal, please click on the link in the chat. Uh, the link will also be sent to you with the uh, evaluation uh, email uh, after this webinar. You can also claim CME credit, of course. So the camera and the microphone will remain off during this webinar. So if you want to ask questions, you are more than welcome to do so. Please use the Q&A uh, and I will look at them at the end. We should have 15 to 20 minutes for questions at the end. Uh, if you also want a bit of banter, you can do so and use the, the chat, but I'm not going to look at the chat for questions. We're not going to be using the raise hand function for questions. Um, so we plan to have a, a panel discussion at the end, uh, and I would encourage you as early as possible to enter your questions during the, the, uh, the various presentations. So you're now going to see uh, the speaker's disclosures. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Shanke Sievers, So he's a radiation oncologist and head of the SABRE service at the Peter Mac uh, Cancer Center uh, in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, he's a funded uh, clinician scientist um, and he has uh, designed a, a large number of clinical trials that I'm sure many of you uh, know about in the context particularly of combining saber and immunotherapy and also in the field of oligometastatic uh, disease. So to you, Shankar. Thank you very much, Corinne. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank you, uh, the IASLC for the opportunity to present to you today. Hopefully this will be an interesting webinar and we'll also cover a lot of territory here. Um, so, yep, I have control of the screen. So. This slide is a bit of a summary of the current era. As we're all aware, we're in the current era of immuno-oncology. And this is a slide just before COVID did hit in, uh, in the first quarter of 2020, showing the two market leaders of uh, checkpoint blockade inhibitors, both anti-PD-1 agents. And the sales for both of these agents were in excess of $5 billion in the US alone for the first quarter of 2020. So clearly these kind of agents are um, uh, not only quite expensive, but they are very prevalent within the use in oncology at present. There is, however, a quite significant need to improve outcomes from checkpoint blockade inhibitors. This is a, an interesting paper from uh, Vinay Prasad and, and group from the JAMA Network Open in 2019. I looked at all the patients currently in oncology or who are potentially eligible or not eligible for checkpoint blockade inhibitors uh, in patients who had advanced cancers. The majority of patients are in fact not eligible with current indications for checkpoint blockade. Uh, however, if we look at the smaller proportion that are uh, benefiting, uh, and that's uh, less than 50% of the patients, um, those uh, sort of eligible for the checkpoint blockade, only about 12 or 13% of patients actually benefit from these treatments. So in fact, have a good outcome from these checkpoint blockade uh, inhibition. Non-small cell lung cancer actually predominates this group. So about 8%, almost 8% of uh, patients who have um, non-small cell lung cancer uh, are um, benefiting from these type of checkpoint blockades. So this is an overrepresented group with lung cancer um, who may potentially benefit from checkpoint blockade. But by and large, we really do need to improve as an urgent need to improve outcomes from these uh, agents. 
So how do we make these uh, effective um, and revolutionary, but rather expensive drugs work better? At the moment, we have a fairly standardized approach. We test drug A with drug B, uh, both delivered through the bloodstream and both limited by the same aspects of trying to actually get penetration within the tumor tissue from the bloodstream and try to test these agents together. However, a potential alternative mechanism would be to look at giving a local modality and some local modalities have been tested, such as surgery or vaccinations, cytolytic um, tumor vaccines. And these are delivered through a different mechanism, either direct to the tumor and uh, um, obviating some of the uh, inherent biological limitations of accessing tumors via the bloodstream. Radiotherapy has been uh, long known to have more than just a direct cell kill effect. But if we know that uh, radiation treatment with a potentially the standard type of radiation that we use, which is conventionally fractionated radiotherapy, the predominant form of cell kill is called mitotic catastrophe on the left side of this graph. And this is a form of cell death that is really low inflammatory and low immunogenic. We are understanding, however, with increasing radiation dose and more hypofractionated treatments, there are alternative forms of cell kill that are pro-inflammatory and potentially uh, pro-immunogenic including as forms of necrosis and some forms of cellular senescence. Hence, in the area of hyperfractionated and ablative therapies, we might be finding more outcomes. We know that radiation upregulates tumor cell uh, checkpoints, um, and these are preclinical studies that have been uh, shown to, to demonstrate this. So this is a, a preclinical study showing that uh, uh, by increasing the dose of radiation uh, in x-rays um, in the top panel there, uh, we can increase the amount of checkpoint blockade protein that is expressed. Um, the mechanism for this is rather through a double chain of DNA break uh, signaling me mechanism and uh, the um, non-homologous end joining repair kind of uh, mechanisms as well as homologous repair mechanisms do increase our IRF1 expression and pd one expression on the tumor cells. The idea that the addition of anti pdl one and radiotherapy in a murine model has been discovered quite early back in 2014. And this is just a cell survival um, curve from a murine model indicating that fractionated radiotherapy five by two gray uh, being the red line there uh, and immunotherapy by itself, anti pdl one the blue line there have um, some uh, similar survival characteristics to no treatment in these mouse models. But the addition of this fractionated radiotherapy and anti pd one uh, really does extend the uh, longevity of this mice uh, in this um, multi-cancer syngenetic, syngenetic uh, cancer model. So the question arises that maybe a blade of radiotherapy or at least hyperfractionated radiotherapy might be a good fit with immunotherapy. This is a, a example of um, different types of uh, I, um, effects of the radiation treatment. So we know that radiotherapy causes direct cellular uh, damage and release of tumor specific antigens. And this results in apoptotic bodies, debris and damage associated uh, molecular proteins being released directly at the tumor microenvironment. This can then result in, in recruitment and activation of dendritic cells and upregulation of ma uh, major histocompatibility protein one for cross presentation of TAAs. Finally, this results in proliferation uh, priming and trafficking of activated CD8 positive T cells back into the tumor site, and these are tumor specific. Radiation also results in cytokine release that can increase vascular permeability and homing of the cells back into the um, um, a tumor environment. Um, so all of these uh, are interesting and maybe actually leads to why we have been seeing the abscopal effect of radiation treatment. The abscopal effect refers to off-target effects from radiation, um, which is uh, Latin for ab being scopus, uh, sorry, away, and scopus being target. And this is uh, a Latin uh, phrase for saying that non-target or off-target effects of localized radiation. So distant tumor sites regressing um, to uh, a localized form of radiotherapy. However, these have been pretty rare events really. And uh, this led us to a paper that we uh, wrote um, suggesting that the abscopal effect could be either fool's, fool's gold or El Dorado, because clinically with radiation alone, we don't necessarily see many of these effects uh, in the clinic. However, there is in renewed interest with the addition of uh, systemic therapies. 
This is an example of a patient uh, of my own, uh, which we did in, see an abscopal response. Uh, and these are multiple panels of uh, FDG PET scans as this patient was on a trial. But this patient received a single fraction of stereotactic radiotherapy of 26 gray to the right uh, lobe of the lung and the top left panel, number one. And in the middle shortly afterwards, within two weeks, had an FDG PET scan as part of the, um, uh, the process. Uh, and she had uh, both a right adrenal metastasis and a painful left hytic, lytic humeral metastasis. Um, and these uh, lesions, um, uh, I referred this patient on towards seeing a medical oncologist at this point and had a backup appointment several months down the track and was surprised to find out that uh, both the um, humeral metastasis and the adrenal metastasis were no longer painful, uh, but also had disappeared on FDG PET. Um, and so this is an example of a patient with stage four metastatic non-small cell lung cancer who had um, regression of uh, their metastatic disease and lived cancer-free for five years before discharge. However, we may not be um, um, all that reliant on single site irradiation for abscopal effects. And this is an interesting uh, communication between um, two groups which are quite strong in this area, which is the Chicago group uh, and um, the Will Cornell group in regards to a study um, from Jason Luke and Stephen Shimura looking at multi-site irradiation in non-small cell lung cancer with pembrolizumab, one of the uh, anti-PD-1 agents. Um, and the conclusions from uh, this particular um, uh, discussion was, given the current lack of clear evidence from abscopal responses of radiation, uh, this group proposed uh, a different mechanism, one which is that radiation really does reduce the tumour volume, which can uh, increase the ratio of proliferating um, key, uh, activated T cells within the tumour cells. Secondly, that radiation is likely to um, uh, have a prophylactic palliation by decreasing the likelihood of metastasis causing harm. And finally, by affording immunotherapy agents sufficient time to induce generating uh, um, its effects. So an alternative point of view, as opposed to single site irradiation to generate abscopal effects is that we really just should use radiation treatment to achieve local control. And this is a, a questionable issue because uh, dosing of radiation is an important aspect. Uh, and rather than underdose for immune stimulation, we may need to consider giving an adequate dose for uh, tumor control. And the concept of debulking more, most or all sites of disease rather than just one for abscopal effects. Nevertheless, this is just a point of view and it's something that needs to be tested in um, future trials. So there's several issues that need to be raised when combining radiation and immunotherapy. And some of these are around about uh, the sequencing uh, and uh, optimal dose fractionation and the right to target volume to use. Some of the early studies, in fact, were using large single doses of radiation. And this is a study from Sean Park's group looking at melanoma and RCC in a murine model. And uh, the use of either control antibody, uh, anti-PD-1 or SABR plus uh, anti-PD-1 um, resulted in similar su survivals, but prolongation and, and of um, survival uh, was noted with the tumor size being uh, smaller with the combination of anti-PD-1 and SABR, single fraction of 15 gray. Shortly after this, there've been several papers looking at controversy and dose fractionation, and these are all quite confusing. Um, there's been a study looking at uh, showing that there's cross priming of anti tumor T cells by a single fraction of 15 grain training lymph nodes in 2005. The Will Cornell group uh, have been showing that uh, in a specific breast murine TSA model, uh, that three by eight gray fractionation, but not single fractionation enhances uh, immune response. Um, a, a separate group uh, um, used a tubo mouse murine uh, breast model, uh, a different model from the Will Cornell group, showing that single fraction SABR does synergize with uh, anti pd one And also uh, furthermore in colorectal cancer, a single fraction of 30 gray and not fractionated 10 by three gray increases cytotoxic uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes cross presentation and reduces T regulatory cells. So the issue is when we look at the actual um, preclinical data, uh, and this is a rather busy slide, but looks at all the different mouse models that have been tested with all the different radiation schedules and all the different immune therapies. There are multiple factors at play, not only the site that's been irradiated, but the type of radiation dose and the immune uh, um, uh, therapy that's been used. And really trying to synergize all this information is quite difficult. 
Interestingly, more recently, the TREX1 story has also uh, emerged again from the World Cornell Group, looking uh, at a different mechanism for why um, a checkpoint blockade could be synergistic with radiation. And this is via an interferon gamma um, pathway. So radiation treatment results in uh, accumulation of cytosolic DNA. And the theory here is on that right-hand panel, large doses of radiation, so single fraction of 20 gray, um, induces TREX1, which then uh, um, uh, consumes the cytosolic D DNA and doesn't allow for uh, synergy with uh, checkpoint blockade. With normal doses or hypofractionated radiation, this does uh, result in accumulation of cytosolic DNA and engagement with the C-gas and sting pathway. And finally, interferon gamma-1 uh, activation of cytotoxic uh, CD8 positive T cells. The timing of RT is also controversial and it may actually depend on the type of agent being used. This is a Murai model, a coronal cancer model using a single fraction of 20 gray. And these, uh, um, ex this experiment was quite elegant in that it used a checkpoint blockade before uh, and after radiation treatment. So on the top left panel, we can see that uh, the uh, tumor is injected into the mice and then checkpoint blockade and then followed by radiation in the first and then two sequences of radiation and then uh, anti-CTLA-4. And the best survivals were seen with the, with the use of radiation first and then anti-CTLA-4, uh, sorry, anti-CTLA-4 first, sorry, it's the wrong one highlighted, and then radiation uh, at day 14. Um, in the other, uh, uh, this same mouse model was used, but then used a, uh, rather than a checkpoint blockade, which is releasing the brakes of the immune system, an anti-OX40 agent, which is an accelerant for the system. And in this situation, using the exact same model, the use of anti-OX40 was most effective given after the radiation treatment. So clearly sequencing is an important aspect. And perhaps the most interesting study that's looked at abscopal effects was not the checkpoint blockade at all, but in the study that was looking at 41 patients with mixed histology cohorts, but using um, a agent that doesn't typically cause uh, uh, abscopal effects on its own, which is GMCSF. Patients were recruited who were either stable or progressing on their initial lines of systemic therapy up to two to three, and then were given uh, radiation to one site of disease, followed by GMCSF, and radiation to another site. And the measured abscopal responses were in the order of uh, 33%. Um, percent. Uh, and so the use of radiotherapy to multiple sites within multiple different tumor associated antigens was really uh, an interesting approach in this kind of uh, study without the use of a, a classic um, a immunotherapy agent. We talked briefly about a tumor site and a study from MD Anderson, Chek Tang and, and, and colleagues. Uh, we're looking at tumor location in addition to several other aspects, including dose and sequencing. But this particular study found that the uh, in um, different advanced solid malignancies, that the use of radiation to the liver appeared to be more immunogenic and induced more infiltrating cytotoxic T cells than radiotherapy to the lung. So not only is dose fractionation an issue, uh, tumor site and the type of agent and sequencing are all issues that need to be fully elucidated in the combination of checkpoint blockade and radiation. And very recently, a study from Ariel Mas uh, Mariscano and group and colleagues uh, we're looking at um, the use of uh, the type of radiation, whether it covers lymph nodes or not, draining lymph nodes, and its act impact on the anti-tumor effect. So on panel A and C on the top, they um, did a quick study from looking, injecting a, um, a, dye, which would, a dye, which was able to localize the draining lymph node. And then on the bottom left is a schema for this murine model, which is injection of MC38 over cells and then use of um, radiotherapy uh, at day 11, around three cycles of immune checkpoint uh, monoclonal antibodies that were injected at day 10, 12, and 14. And panel C shows that radiotherapy to the tumor alone results in increased uh, um, infiltrating uh, T cells and um, uh, longer survival than uh, radiation of the draining lymph node. And this was accentuated on the far right with the use of um, anti-CTLA-4 checkpoint blockade inhibition. So radiotherapy to the tumor alone with anti-CTLA-4 had the longest survival in this group as compared to radiation of the lymph nodes and uh, um, with a combination of anti-CTLA-4 or just the drug itself. So I'm just going to close on uh, some of the toxicities of combining cyber and immunotherapy because this is an area that uh, we're all interested in uh, at the moment. 
Um, and one of the studies that is currently running that's hopefully going to be very uh, informative in the space is the Toast um, uh, Prospective Registry. So this is a study that's been run out of Switzerland um, from Stephanie Kritz and uh, uh, Matthias Gutenberg's group. Uh, and looking at multiple countries, we are also participating in this uh, in, at the Penny Cullen Cancer Centre. Um, and so far, uh, there is 483 patients who have been prospectively collected with either the use of combination SABRE with uh, uh, targeted therapies or immune checkpoint inhibition. And the total grade three acute uh, toxicities um, with these combinations of both SABRE and uh, targeted agents or immunotherapy is 12%. And it doesn't appear to be much in the way of added benefit with either pausing the systemic therapy or giving a break between the systemic therapies. And with a rate of 12%, uh, you could arguably say that these kind of radiation and you know, immune um, checkpoint blockade or targeted therapy and toxicity rates from high grade toxicity is additive rather than synergistic. But that's a, a topic worthy of discussion. From a thoracic perspective, we're obviously interested in pneumonitis as a particular issue. And this is uh, data uh, presented at uh, Lung Cancer Congress last year in 2019, uh, sorry, 2019 uh, in Barcelona. Um, seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, although this is for renal cell carcinoma, this is uh, an oligometastatic study of which we did multiple radiation to pulmonary targets. So this is a single fraction of 20 gray to each oligometastasis. And when unable to do so, uh, 30 gray in three fraction. Um, in three gray fractions. And this is followed by six months or eight cycles of adjuvant uh, pembrolizumab starting about between five and seven days after SABR. So of the 21 patients who had pulmonary metastasis, we had 43 targets. Uh, and the majority of patients um, had a single lung metastasis, but there were multiple patients who had multiple lung metastases, the majority of the whom were receiving a single fraction of 20 gray of SABR followed by immunotherapy. And um, you know, the response to that is interesting, uh, just interesting to note that the majority of patients had um, uh, demonst demonstrable uh, response with a CRPR rate of 44% in this group um, and disease control of 70% in this group. Um, however, probably more interesting is that um, three of the patients stopped with grade three pneumonitis. And this is after three, six and seven cycles of immunotherapy. And the worst grade of immune related adverse events was grade three uh, in these patients. So about 20% of these patients had some of these grade three events. And those patients who had the, immune, uh, the pneumonitis had one, two and one uh, lung oligomet respectively. So it wasn't the total number of mets. We had up to five uh, lung metastases. Uh, so it didn't seem to be necessarily related to that. But there were no grade four or grade five adverse events. And uh, even um, a quarter of these patients reported no adverse events of this treatment at all. So grade three pneumonitis rate of 15% is definitely higher than what we'd expect with either SABA or pembrolizumab alone. Uh, the question is whether this uh, issue is synergistic or in my opinion, uh, potentially additive. So in summary, the combination of radiotherapy and immunotherapy has strong preclinical rationale. There's multiple studies with MURI models and also in vitro in v, uh, studies that have looked at uh, the combination of radiotherapy, immunotherapy, and radiation itself does uh, induce uh, uh, immune response or sort of responses. Abscopal effects with ra uh, radiation therapy alone are rare. We are increasingly seeing them in the stereotactic era. However, it is still a rare event and cannot be relied upon. We think that synergy with radiotherapy and immuno-oncology to enhance abscopal responses are likely to be um, the way forward. Um, the question is whether toxicities are additive rather than synergistic. And the unanswered question, that, in, in my opinion, are the timing of savior around systemic therapy, um, whether we pause if it's before or after the treatment, the ideal dose fractionation schedule to be using, uh, the optimal agent for combination, and the optimal target site for radiation for if we have multiple organs to pick from and whether single site radiation or maximal site reduction is the best approach. And there's still clinical data that's emerging. <laughs> Dr. Thielen will be continuing from this point, but I'd just like to highlight, we're hopefully going to have some data of our own clinical trial uh, through Australia and New Zealand, which is a randomized phase two study of the addition of single site radiotherapy uh, to nivolumab in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, this study was aiming to recruit 120 patients. Unfortunately, it closed early. We should have some data uh, in the next month or so. And uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for your attention and hand over back to our chair, Corinne. 
Thank you very much, Shankar, for a, an excellent talk. So we'll take the, the questions at the end. Uh, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Wilhelmin Fellen. So she's a pneumonologist uh, from uh, the uh, National Cancer Institute in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, and she's been working there since 2014. She recently finished a PhD focusing on exploring and modulating the microenvironment in non-small cell lung cancer. And she will be now working on uh, the combination of uh, advanced immunotherapy trials in non-small cell lung cancer, uh, particularly in combination with radiotherapy. So we're looking forward to your talk, uh, Billamin. Okay, great. Thank you so much for this introduction. And, and thank you all for, for inviting me to uh, introduce you on uh, some of the data. Uh, can I have the next slides? Thank you. Um, First, I want to um, talk a little bit of the current uh, facts and the clinical situation in advanced non-small cell lung cancer, as this is important uh, to uh, fully understand how radiotherapy and immune therapy combinations uh, um, can have a future in, in, in uh, treatment of patients. Um, we know from recent trials that the overall response rate of uh, checkpoint inhibition monotherapy um, is around 20%. Uh, which is great, but still means that we have a long way to go. We have seen long and durable responses in these patients. And uh, from the early phase one trials, we know that uh, this treatment is able to improve five-year overall survival rates. Um, the response rate do depend on uh, pd one expression on tumor cells, but even the tumors that show no pd one expression at all still have a 9% chance of responding uh, to uh, uh, ntp one or ntpd one uh, checkpoint inhibition, which is of course a very interesting finding. We see that uh, patients with tumors with high pd one expression of over 50% of tumor cells have a higher response rate of around 45%. Uh, percent. Um, still impressive, and for that reason, they did a first line trial where they, um, uh, in this specific subgroup of patients with high pd one expression, and in first line, they compared uh, pembrolizumab to PD-1 uh, PD um, inhibitor uh, versus a platinum-based uh, chemotherapy. And uh, they showed in the Checkpoint 24 study that uh, monotherapy pembrolizumab um, showed better responses and is for this specific subgroup now the number of choice of treatment. They also did another um, keynote uh, in squamous and in non-squamous where they combined platinum-based chemo together with uh, anti-PD-1 uh, treatment. They did this uh, in all comers, so irrespective of PD-1 expression, and they found that the combination treatment uh, proves to be better for patient outcomes uh, without adding any signif uh, significant toxicity, which is very interesting. So PD-1 uh, or PD-01 treatment is now standard of care in first line advanced non-small cell uh, lung cancer for, well, actually all patients, uh, some with or some without chemotherapy. This is all about the patients who do not have a, a non-smoker or a uh, mutational driver, but for uh, the ones who don't, um, uh, immunotherapy is now an important uh, first line treatment option. Next slide, please. Can I have the next? Yeah, thank you. Um, we also tried to add anti ctl 4 uh, treatment to uh, uh, first line or, or, or beyond. And this has led to significantly more toxicity that has to be uh, said about that treatment. Um, but we did see some responses, and this might be uh, a solution for patients that have tumors with low or negative pd one expression, and they do not tolerate or do not want to receive any chemotherapy, this might be an option because uh, these patients have a higher response rate, uh, this specific group. But still, uh, primary and secondary resistance to immune therapy develops. And so there is still a very high need to optimize the, the treatment of, of non-small cell lung cancer patients. And um, like uh, Dr. Shiva, has already uh, shown us before, these scope of responses that could be induced by radiotherapy 
uh, together with immune therapy might be a way forward uh, for uh, specific patients. Next slides. I want to first talk a little bit further about a little bit more about the safety issue this might uh, uh, this combination might might uh, have, and especially in our uh, lung cancer patients, uh, which are a little bit more prone uh, to developing uh, pneumonitis or pulmonary toxicity. Uh, this could be very uh, an important issue as we know that immune therapy has uh, a chance of developing immune uh, responses and immune adverse events. And we also know that radiotherapy might induce inflammation. So a case like this where pneumonitis has happened uh, might occur more often. Next slide. Um, many retrospective small series have been evaluated uh, on the combination uh, in regards to safety. Uh, most of those uh, retrospective series said that there are no real concern in regards to, to, to safety. And an interesting subgroup analysis from uh, the keynote 001 trial, phase one trial with nivolumab, where they compared the patient that had received uh, extracranial uh, radiotherapy previously to entering the trial versus the patient who had never received any radiotherapy. Uh, first of all, they didn't see any real differences between uh, pulmonary toxicity uh, in both groups. Uh, numerical uh, was a little bit higher in the patients that had received radiotherapy, but grade three was similar. And they did find an interesting uh, thing that the uh, group with radiotherapy had an improved uh, PFS and also an improved overall survival. But again, this is retrospective, of course, this has to be taken with cautious. Um, Luke and colleagues uh, performed and published in 2018 a prospective safety study where they treated uh, 73 patients with the combination of pembrolizumab and uh, SBRT on two to four tumor lesions. They did have some uh, grade D3 uh, toxicities, um, where they did see some pneumonitis in a couple of patients, colitis and hepatitis. And in at least in one patient, the pneumonitis was correlated to long SBRT, but not in all. And overall, they regarded it as safe, as a safe combination. And as I mentioned before, anti-CTLA-4 uh, treatment has a little bit higher chance of uh, giving uh, uh, toxic uh, toxicities. Uh, the group of uh, Formenti in, uh, in, in New York did a combination of fractionated radiotherapy, two different regimes, and they, com they uh, combined this with safety 4 uh, inhibition. I didn't, didn't see any uh, additive adverse events. It was comparable that, to what you would expect on monotherapy. And also an interesting finding in their translational research that they did see uh, T cell activation in all patients that received this treatment, but the responders showed a specific upper regulation in uh, radiotherapy related genes. So they suggested that there uh, are signs in this combination as well of uh, an episcopal effect. Next slide, please. Uh, I do want to um, point out two concerns, however. Um, a very recent publication in Animal Cell Oncology by the group of Shiverdian, they did a retrospective analysis of a specific patient group, namely the patients that had a history of immune-related adverse events on immune checkpoint inhibition. And they looked into that group of, uh, of those patients uh, if they received thoracic radiotherapy after having developed an IR, um, IA, um, if they're, and, and they found that these patients not, are, not only seem to be prone to um, um, immune-related to toxicities, but if you radiate them afterwards, they have a higher chance of developing a pneumonitis. And this was associated with, with higher uh, with the height of the mean lung dose, but even saw that at a relatively low dose of, of, of a little bit over five gray, um, development of pneumonitis was higher than they would expect. And the authors suggest from this uh, retrospective series that um, you have to be aware that in this specific, this specific subgroup of patients, you might 
re reduce the mean lung dose a little bit if you wanna if you wanna treat those patients with the thoracic radiotherapy. And a second concern that I would like to point out um, is that this is especially seen in melanoma patients, but we see it more and more in the non-small cell lung cancer patients as well, that in series, we've seen that these patients who develop brain metastasis and they get upfront radiation uh, and then are treated with immune checkpoint emission, a doubling of the incidence of radio, uh, radiation necrosis um, develops. And um, I think that from these experiences, uh, I do think that we need to be very uh, cautious that if we see patients that have brain metastasis, maybe asymptomatic, and when patients have a high chance of response to immune checkpoint inhibition, uh, I think you should carefully evaluate whether you should give upfront radiotherapy or maybe you should for this specific patient group may uh, uh, try and, and, and let do the immune therapy, do the work on the brain metastasis as well as we know that they can have responses on uh, brain metastasis on uh, immune uh, checkpoints alone. So I do think that this, these are two specific concerns that we need to look forward or look, look into to the clinic to be careful with that. The next slide, please. Next slide, yeah, thank you. Um, then over to the uh, efficacy. Um, this is one of the patients that I treated in, uh, that we treated in the Pembroke RT trial that I wanna show, to, show you the results. This was a trial that we performed in the Netherlands and um, where you can see on the left side in the red circle was uh, uh, one of the pulmonary metastases um, in the left lower lobe, which we treated with radiotherapy. And on the upper, upper uh, uh, slide, you can see uh, in uh, four years, which was uh, two years after we stopped the pembrolizumab because of ongoing response, this patient still has an ongoing response, not only in the radiated lesions, but also in all the other lesions. And this patient is still in very good health. Next slide. And the trial that I uh, talked about is the PEMBRA RT trial where we uh, randomized 74 patients in total um, between uh, receiving pembrolizumab alone versus um, SBRT or three times eight gray. I'm not a, a radiotherapist, so some people pointed out to me that maybe sometimes or that maybe three times eight gray shouldn't be referred to as SBRT. If people here uh, listening to my talk uh, think so, then I'm, I apologize for that. Um, but we treated them with uh, three times eight gray on a single tumor lesion, and then they received pembrolizumab within seven days of the last radiation dose. This was in second line and further, so patients were uh, already uh, treated with uh, platinum-based uh, chemotherapy before and then had developed progression. We did serial biopsies uh, in these patients before treatment and on treatment um, to, 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 to do some translational work afterwards. These patients weren't allowed to have had radiotherapy within six months as to not influence the outcomes maybe. And this one, we, we started this trial in 2015 where we didn't have access to pd one um, staining at that time. So we chose to do a stratification by smoking status instead of pd one which would be something we would do, we would do now, but we, 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 we went for smoking status. Next slide, please. Uh, so here are the results of the trial. They were published in 2019 in Yam Oncology. And here you can see that in blue, you see the line of the experimental arm of the patients that received SBRT and then received the pembrolizumab. And they did perform uh, better in regards to PFS as well as in overall survival. Uh, these differences were, weren't uh, statistically significant, but this phase two trial, however, does show a sign that uh, patients might benefit from this combination treatment. We had uh, a little bit of a disbalance between pd one height of pd one expression. We had higher pd one patients, a little bit more higher pd one patients in the experimental arm. So this might, has, might have influenced the data a little bit afterwards, 
but we uh, made subgroup analysis looking into different uh, pd one subgroups. And uh, we did find a signal that in the, in especially the, the pd one negative subgroup patients seem to benefit more of the addition of radiotherapy because these were small numbers or, or significantly different. Next slide. We also, of course, uh, looked into toxicities. Uh, and these are the toxicities related to the pembrolizumab. And these were similar in both arms. And this treatment was, um, was, was very well um, uh, performed by the patients. We had one patient that had received uh, SBRT on a retroperitoneal lesion in close relation to the kidney. And, uh, and, and subsequently developed an nephritis on pembrolizumab. So this was a toxicity that I believe is really related to the combination and, and to the radiotherapy specifically on that lesion. Um, but pneumonitis, we had a lot of thoracic radiotherapy in this trial and pneumonitis numbers are really low, even more higher in the control arm. So in regards to toxicities, uh, we concluded that this was really safe to perform and that there was a, 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 a sign that this might benefit at least some patients. Next slide. Um, and then we joined forces with the group of uh, Jim Welsh at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, they did a similar trial uh, like the Pember RT. They, did, they made two cohorts, uh, however, uh, they had one uh, radiotherapy cohort where they had uh, uh, 15 fractions up to 45 gray. And the, um, that cohort has it, had its own um, control group. And they had a second cohort where they gave four fractions uh, up to 50 gray um, with their own control group. And this, this was not a randomized choice, the uh, radiotherapy regime, but these were uh, seen fit by the physician, which radiation dose the patients could, could receive. So that makes comparison between arms a little bit difficult, but if you pull all the data and you pull all the uh, um, control arms, you can do a, a nice comparison uh, together with the patient that we treated in the PEMBRA R3. And we did see a better balance in characteristics, in baseline characteristics, especially in regards to the pd one status, which was now um, uh, well balanced between uh, both uh, groups. The next slide. And these are the results of this pooled analysis that we uh, um, uh, that was uh, in Lancet uh, Respiratory Medicine last year. And here um, you, we do see uh, significant benefits of the combination of radiotherapy with immune therapy. Uh, they had uh, a significantly better PFS uh, as well as an overall survival. Of course, it was a, 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 a retrospect, or, or, or at least we, we pulled the data. So um, this has to be taken with a little bit of caution, but I do believe that there is a, a, an even stronger sign here that in efficacy, this might help patients um, having a benefit on immunotherapy. Uh, this is still not strong enough to make this a standard of care, uh, unfortunately. So uh, there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that we did look into in this pooled analysis was a comparison of the radiotherapy regimens. And I uh, already explained to you because these patients were at randomized that this is um, highly, uh, this is at most uh, hypothesis generating and there cannot be really hard conclusions drawn from this. But we did see that the patients that received the 15 fraction uh, radiotherapy regime, they did not have, seem to have an advantage compared to the, the, the PEMRO alone group. And we thought that maybe because lymphocytes might, uh, are very sensitive to radiotherapy, um, we postulated that maybe um, the, the, the higher and, and the bigger field that was radiated might be detrimental to the upscopal effect. And we did see, uh, you can see that on the right side of the screen, the lower, the, the lower box uh, plot, where you can see that the difference between uh, before and after the radiotherapy 
uh, in uh, lymphocyte count, the blood of the patients is uh, lowered in uh, the 45 gray 15 fractions, uh, which is not which was not different before and after in uh, in the other two groups. So this might maybe be why this group performed um, um, did did not show a, a, a strong uh, abscopal effect. So this has something that needs to be in taken into account um, regarding the many questions that. Uh, uh, Dr. Shiva has already mentioned at the end of his, his talk, uh, which we still need to answer. And these are little specks of data that might help a little bit with that. And the next slide, please. I do want to mention something about uh, uh, the oligometastatic non-small cell lung cancer. This is, of, of course, a really interesting subgroup. Uh, know that local ablative therapy for these patients um, is uh, beneficial. Um, and Bamel uh, published in 2019 a trial where they did a single arm phase two uh, study um, where they uh, had oligometastatic non small cell lung cancer uh, treated with adjuvant pembrolizumab after the locally uh, ablative therapy. And um, they um, established that this was relatively safe to do. All 11% um, of pneumonitis is a little bit higher than you would expect normally. But they did had a, a, a very impressive uh, PFS of 19 months versus uh, historical control. So um, the role of um, pembrolizumab in this oligometastatic disease is really um, interesting and, and, and it needs to be explored further. And next slide shows a very important trial, um, the PACIFIC trial. These, uh, this concerns patients that are treated with, uh, that, are, that have locally advanced on, on uh, resectable non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, standard of care of these patients has always and since long time been chemo radiation uh, therapy. And um, this has been for many years. Uh, and now finally, we have a trial um, which really shows a benefit for this specific patient subgroup. They, um, what they did was patients who had uh, an, a response, did not show any disease progression after the chemo radiation treatment. They received one year of adjuvant durvolumab, uh, a pd one uh, inhibitor versus placebo. And they saw that the their volumop subgroup had a better overall survival and a better PFS compared to the placebo group. Um, so this was really, and now this has um, become the new standard of care for these locally advanced on resectable non-small cell lung cancer patients. Uh, they didn't see um, that much added toxicity. And at first we were a little bit afraid of pneumonitis for this specific patient group. But the grade three to four was um, comparable between both arms, so that was good, uh, good, good to see. What I find really interesting in this setting is that we don't really know whether um, this is the effect uh, of an abscopal effect, where the radiotherapy and the immunotherapy really work synergistically. And uh, this is difficult to tell. Maybe it's just because we give the immunotherapy. Uh, before we have established a stage four and um, that that is the reason why these patients uh, perform better. So this, uh, how impressive it is, it still leaves um, a lot of, of questions in regard how to optimize for these patients the combination of radiotherapy and immunotherapy. So other trials are ongoing in, in stage three uh, disease at the moment. So I want to mention the Nicholas study. They have um, um, given already some uh, safety data. In this study, nivolumab is given concurrently with chemo radiation and has been deemed safe up till now. Um, efficacy data is awaited. Uh, not sure whether this is going to show any benefit over the benefit the Pacific has already shown. Um, but um, the, given it concurrently might be one way to go forward. Uh, next slide. Because uh, then I want to show you this trial. This is a trial that we're currently uh, performing at the NKI, where I work. 
Uh, this has a different approach. Uh, this also concerns uh, patients uh, with locally advanced that are treated with chemo radiation. But here we're trying to treat these patient, patients with neoadjuvant immunotherapy. And as mentioned before, from some preclinical data, maybe anti-CTLA-4 body body sh antibodies should be given uh, before the radiotherapy. So this trial combines uh, the PD-L1 inhibitor Dervalimab with the CTLA-4 uh, antibody Tremolimumab in two courses before uh, given those patients chemo radiation, and afterwards they're still uh, they still get their one year of Dervalimab. And uh, we're uh, currently uh, working on the feasibility phase. Cohort 1A was a success, and we're currently working on cohort, including patients for cohort uh, 2A. And these patients, they get a restaging after the neoadjuvant immunotherapy before they get the concurrent chemo radiation. So I'm really excited in, in finding out whether this approach uh, might even uh, further improve benefit for these patients, and if we can find uh, signs of scopal effects um, by uh, doing it this way. Next slide, please. And this will be my, my, my last slide uh, because I want to share with you some future uh, per step perspectives. Um, first of all, in the advanced states, I've shown you some data of uh, SBRT or a radiotherapy with immune therapy, uh, monotherapy that is. I think we still uh, still a lot of work needs to be performed. So I'm, I'm, we're working on a lot of translational research in the PEMBRA-RT trial um, to further explain the biological principle of the obscopal effects and try to investigate whether uh, which patients benefit from this combination. Uh, also, um, diagnostic trials comparing the timing and the different radiotherapy uh, regimens uh, need to need to be developed to further explore um, the optimal uh, way to do uh, abscopal effects. Um, and it might be interesting, we have seen some case reports where patients developed resistance to immune checkpoint inhibition, and they were, those, uh, those patients were able with a combination of radiotherapy and retreatment of uh, immunotherapy um, could uh, receive novel responses. So this is something that would be very interesting to look into in the future as well. And as mentioned in earlier stages, um, the combination is also being explored. Uh, trials are giving adjuvant immune therapy after SBRT and, and other trials are currently ongoing of adding uh, uh, immunotherapy to chemo radiation, uh, concurrent application of immune um, of checkpoint inhibition with concurrent radiations are ongoing. And another trial we're currently performing at the NKI is really a more of a diagnostic trial where we compare patients uh, that go for surgery, which have stage one, and we give them new edge vent pembrolizumab versus uh, uh, SBRT uh, versus pembrolizumab together with SBRT. And we're not only looking to the effects of the tumor, pre and post, but we'll also be looking at the effects of the draining lymph nodes. So hopefully all of these efforts are going to help us further understand the scopal effects and help us designing trials, how to um, further improve um, uh, patient outcomes with, uh, with this um, combination treatment. Thanks a lot, Willemin, for uh, this very nice talk. So we now have a bit of time for some questions. We may, um, you know, if some of you can stay, sort of go over slightly. Uh, we've had quite a number of questions, which I'm going to group um, sort of between uh, toxicity, efficacy, abscopal effect, and number of questions on brain metastasis, which I think is very interesting. Um, so the first question uh, is about the, the tumor volume impact uh, on pneumonitis rates. So uh, from studies such as the Luke study and the Palmer study. So what is your view? Perhaps Shankar, do you want to take that question? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, that was from David Rabin. And I think the question on uh, tumor volume is a reasonable one. I think the more lung that is irradiated, the more likelihood of getting pneumonitis and uh, radiation fields independently, larger volumes have a larger toxicity rate. 
So I think it, it's an additive effect uh, with the, the likelihood of high grade toxicity um, and checkpoint blockade. And so, yeah, I do think tumor volume will have an effect on both um, on toxicity rates. Yeah, and I think it's a real shame that we, you know, we don't have any data on tumor volume from a Pacific study. That's you know one of the sort of important data that is unfortunately missing. And then we've had uh, also a question about um, the timing um, of the immunotherapy and radiotherapy, which is really important in terms of avoiding the overlapping in toxicity. So in terms of the sequencing, and if we think about the routine setting, what would you advise, for example, in someone who's got stage four disease, um, is receiving a palliative course of radiotherapy on an immune checkpoint inhibitor, would you stop the treatment in advance or perhaps vitamin? What do you do at the NKI? Yeah, if we have a patient that is already treated with the immunotherapy and they develop a progressive disease, disease where you want therapy, I think that, you know, we just continue with the immunotherapy. The half-life of these agents is, is, is extremely long, um, um, over a month, so stopping it is probably not that, that necessary. And, and I yep. think that the current data shows that this is relatively safe to apply uh, together. So in, in, as regard to safety, um, I, I wouldn't have too much trouble. Yeah. And if at all possible, I think, you know, continue recruiting patients to clinical trials where that is recorded and there are studies in the oligometastatic setting, for example, where, you know, there is an option of continuing or stopping the drug. And I think we'll learn a lot from that. Okay, now some questions more around efficacy. So um, a question from uh, Gerald Walls in Belfast. Um, are there any concerns that lymphopenia secondary to radical radiotherapy doses could impact on efficacy of the either the adjuvant of a concomitant, concomitant immunotherapy? So again, Philemon, do you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah, I, I do think that this is, of course, a very important and a very interesting question. And this is exactly what we try to look into the, in our pooled analysis. And we did find some signs that lymphopenia might produce a problem in the episcopal effect. So I, I really do think that this is something that we really need to look into uh, even further. And uh, the stage three disease patients where uh, a relatively large area is, uh, is radiated uh, would probably help us uh, giving answers to these questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you want to add anything to that, Shanka? Yeah, I think I might actually um, pull this in with a question from Gava Plavich. I'm sorry if I've murdered this uh, surname, but um, who's also asking about whether uh, low-dose uh, radiotherapy, um, which is actually whole body radiotherapy, can, can affect mm. cause, cause lymphopenia. It's a really yep. qu complex question because um, there was a preclinical model I showed from um, Mariscano's group that looked at uh, draining lymph node radiation being detrimental. Uh, yet the best data we have is, is basically Pacific, which is looking at involved mediastinal lymph nodes and the addition of uh, immunotherapy afterwards. So it is a complex thing regarding the tumor volume, the inclusion of uh, radiation of, of uninvolved lymph nodes. I'm sure that's a bad thing because that will um, prevent the expansion of uh, adapted um, T cells, cytotoxic T cells and uh, ring reduction within the systemic circulation. So uninvolved in, um, lymph node radiation is probably a bad thing. We know that lymphocyte neutrophil count um, is an independent <laughs> core prognostic feature. Um, so even before the immunotherapy era, lymphopenia was an issue. Um, and uh, I think that the, in the ideal situation, if we can irradiate the primary only uh, in advanced disease, um, but if we're talking about locally advanced disease, I think we have to cover all the lymph nodes as we would normally do. Yeah, so actually I was going to raise that as a sort of a, a bit of a provocative question, you know, this um, idea of perhaps only treating part of a disease of so the primary, not treating the, the lymph nodes, is that, uh, is that going to become a reality or is it still a, a fantasy? I think it's a very important clinical question. So uh, we're trying to open a study like this through um, the TOGA Thoracic Oncology uh, uh, Group of Australasia, which is looking at um, primary radiation of the tumor in advanced uh, lung uh, cancer, and also lung cancer called prime lung. Um, I think that's be a really interesting question, but it's experimental, of course. Mm. Um, mm. 
And, you know, with lymphopenia, the idea of whole body irradiation, the, you know, the presumption is that uh, some of these low dose radiation, in the whole body is, is going to eradicate some of this uh, exhausted T cell uh, mm. profile phenotype that we see from uh, within the microenvironment, allowing expansion of adapted T cells uh, to, to reenter into the microenvironment. So, yep. you know, there's a whole bunch of things that's really complex here that we don't fully understand. Yes, the message is uh, do not try this in your clinic. That is uh, not really ready for prime time as yet. Uh, now, a, a very important question from a colleague of mine, Dr. Ahmed Salem, about the hypoxic microenvironment and is that a barrier in terms of the uh, efficacy of immunotherapy and radiotherapy? And is there a merit to combine uh, in trials immunotherapy, hypoxia modification, and radiotherapy? And how can we investigate that? Do you want to say that one, Shankar? Yeah, look, I think um, hypoxia is a real issue. And I think particularly if we're looking at a drug that's trying to enter into in a hypoxic tumor microenvironment uh, via the bloodstream, it's, it is a major issue. So uh, this is something that needs to be overcome. Radiation is great at a local effect, but in advanced lung cancer, we really can't do this for multiple targets effectively at this point in time. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, trials. I'm not sure, um, mm -hmm. Lamine, if, you, if you're aware of any trials in combining hypoxic modification agents, but I'd be interested to see them. No, I, I don't know any of these trials uh, are currently ongoing. Uh, in, in, in the Netherlands, we did a trial uh, with radiotherapy and uh, NO, uh, which was negative, unfortunately. So, um, but I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not aware of anything that is uh, looking into this at the moment. No. Okay, so now I'd like to move on. Uh, so we're just going to use a few more minutes, if that's okay with the audience, because we have some really interesting. We will be able to address everything, but really an enormous problem, um, you know, in patients with lung cancer, and a lot of questions about immunotherapy in these patients. Uh, so a question um, from Nora Sundal asking um, if we consider withholding radiotherapy for these patients, um, even though they generally were excluded in the trials investigating checkpoint uh, inhibitors uh, in case of brain metastasis. So what's, what's, what's your practice? So Willemann, what's your practice at the NKI? This is, exact, this is exactly, this is a, a very hot topic at, at our uh, institute as well. Um, and I think that this is something that we really discuss in a case uh, by case uh, basis, uh, whether these patients, uh, it, it depends on so many, on, on so many um, items. Um, are they symptomatic? I mean, if they are symptomatic, I would be, um, um, I, I would prefer giving to radiate the patients. And then, but then the second problem, of course, is that they often get high doses of uh, steroids afterwards, which might be detrimental mm -hmm. for the effect of your immun immunotherapy. We're not sure, but it might be so. Um, so if, if we do see uh, an opportunity to uh, withhold radiotherapy, um, because we think that we could give the immune therapy a, a chance, then we would be um, willing to do that, actually. Mm -hmm. Are trying to withhold it if we think it is safe. And we have seen some very good responses uh, in, in, in brain meds. Uh, so, so we know that this can be done, but but of course, case by case basis, you do not you do not want to have your patient develop uh, symptomatic brain meds while you're already on systemic treatment. Mm -hmm. And Shanka, do you want to add to that? One hundred percent agree. I think the clinical um, uh, priority is the patient. So if they're symptomatic brain meds, deal with them first. If it's asymptomatic and small. Then the questions that come up are the uh, extracranial burden of disease. You know, if it's high and low volume brain metastasis, certainly start with the systemic therapy first. Um, but it is a case by case situation. And you talked about uh, the, the potential issue. I think it was Willemann who talked about the potential issue of combining um, radiotherapy to the brain and IO. I mean, do we know much about the differential between whole brain radiotherapy and SRS in these patients who are also receiving immunotherapy? 
Uh, I don't know that data specific whether that matters, but I do think that, especially in my institute, um, we don't very often use whole brain radiotherapy anymore. It's all gamma knife and, and, and stereotech radiotherapy. Uh, and I do believe that chances on uh, radiation necrosis is, is way higher uh, with that approach. So um, but even though chances are higher of radiation necrosis, we do tend to choose uh, over stereotactic radiation over whole brain radiotherapy, even in this setting. Okay. And then again, with regards to efficacy, so you, know, you both talked about um, uh, the different uh, dose fractionation regime that are used and what is optimal. And there's still many, many questions about that. And uh, Dave Rabin has been raising this uh, issue of, you know, what should we treat? He's saying we should stay away from ENI, which I think most of us are doing now. Um, but he's raising the issue of using hypofractionation in stage three disease versus six weeks of uh, chemo radiotherapy to avoid immunosuppression. Um, and that's very topical, obviously, in the era of uh, COVID. Um, is that something that you would consider in your practice using more hypofractionated treatments or so such as the regimes we use in the UK, 55 brain, 20 fractions or other? Shanka, do you want to take that one? For me, I think the, um, the, the, we don't have all of the answers in terms of dose fractionation as yet. So I think the underlying principle is treat the patient as you would normally treat them. Um, and so if that means in the COVID era, hyperfractionated treatments, I think that's mm -hmm. fine. Uh, I don't know that a, a single fraction of 20 gray is worse than eight by three. And I don't know that it's eight by three is better than a very large fractionation schedule, say if, um, you know, 50 and five. We don't have these answers yet. So I think we treat the lesion in question and the patient in question uh, on, the, on the merits and then use the addition of the systemic therapy uh, in that context. That's my personal opinion. Okay, thanks for that. And then uh, there's this question specifically uh, for Villamin on the... So you describe a, a higher benefit for the addition of SBRT in patients with PL1 negative tumors. Could this be explained by the imbalance in PL1 expression? between the experimental and control groups, or do you think this could be of clinical importance? Uh, and could you explain in the latter case, this effect? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't think um, if, when you look in the subgroup of uh, the pd one negative patients, we compare the effects of SBRT uh, at the experimental arm versus the control arm in, both in, 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 the, in, the, in the whole group of pd one negative patients. So this was not not caused by the imbalance. Um, the, the conclusion that we um, um, draw from that specific subgroup analysis was that, that maybe uh, radiotherapy was able to um, make a non-inflamed tumor an inflamed tumor and therefore raising the response chances of immunotherapy. That was our hypothesis. Um, from uh, that subgroup analysis in the PEMBRT trial. Um, in the pooled analysis, analysis uh, however, we couldn't find a specific effect in the pd one ne negative subgroup. So based on the additional analysis we did, I'm still not really sure if our previous conclusion about the subgroup analysis in pd one negative tumors was true. So I do think that we need to do a lot more work to, to really know if, um, if, if we have something for this negative subgroup. I'm not sure at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, Tamuna Chachava is asking whether we have any data on combination of uh, immune checkpoint and an antiandrogenics with radiotherapy. Any of you know about that? Not yet. No, I think this is an open question. Um, it's interesting because I think radiation has an anti-angiogenic effect anyway. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure if it's just going to be additive toxicity without necessarily benefit. But I'm interested. Uh, Willemine, what do you think? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure. Which question are we discussing? 
Eight on antiangiogenics plus immunotherapy plus radiotherapy. Do we know of any data on that? The answer is probably no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, just I'm conscious of time, so we're going to close in a minute, but uh, uh, with regards to upscopal effects, um, there's a question from Anna Maria Catino about, uh, uh, do we think that adding radiotherapy during immunotherapy for advanced lung cancer could, have, could lead to an upscopal effect? Um, does the timing matter? So in the, I guess in the routine setting, is that something that you would advocate you know, given the experience that you described from the trials? Personally, not yet. I think this uh, should really be confined to clinical trials at present. Um, uh -huh. And so when I'm asked to just irradiate a lesion <laughs> and see what happens, I don't often say yes. Um, but if there is a lesion that looks like it will be causing uh, harm in the future, so early prophylaxis uh -huh. that might benefit from radiation, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. And you carry on with the immune checkpoint inhibitor. Correct. Uh, and as yeah. Dr. Tillen was mentioning, these checkpoint blockades have months half-life. So if someone's yes. oligo progressing, I don't bother stopping. Uh, and if we have a situation with an upfront indication, then irradiate a, a dominant lesion and, and then commence the systemic therapies is a good combination, I think. Okay, that's great. So just to... to uh, to, come, to finish this, this really interesting Q&A session, just to ask you very briefly, to both of you, um, if you had to put your money on a strategy in terms of uh, immunotherapy, radiotherapy combination, what would that be? So, Willem, Willem do you want to uh, tell me what you think? Well, um, what I would be really interesting to, to, to do as a next step after that we uh, we did the, the PEMBRA RT trial, I mean, um, of, of course, I want to know more about the translational business, but um, that is still ongoing. So for me, a next step would be whether we could reinvigorate uh, responses on immune therapy after progression on first line treatment with this combination and then maybe add TTLA4 with um, a retreatment of PD-1 in combination with radiotherapy. I, I think that that would be the next step for me to explore whether that would, could be possible. Okay, great. And then Shanka? For me, I think uh, it's the kitchen sink approach. So multi-site irradiation, multi-organ if possible, uh, and before and after the first cycle of immunotherapy. Uh, so really to cover all bases, I think the questions are too complex to answer necessarily quickly uh, on their own. So do the whole thing. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. So I think I'm um, sure, you know, it is, it, it is time for you to either get on with your day or have your evening dinner, depending on where you are. So I'd like uh, to thank uh, both Philippe and Shanka for wonderful presentations and for the ASLC for putting this together. So uh, Keep an eye on your emails. You will re be receiving CME uh, information uh, and program evaluation. Uh, and thank you all for your participation and uh, speak to you all soon. Hopefully one day safe, you know, face to face and importantly, stay safe. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much.